on his screen, getting ready for his game. Obviously, his opening it was probably prepared this morning. And here we go. Okay, now it starts, you guys. Now it does start, and it's the King's Pawn opening. And throughout the tour, we've seen this between the two. Uh, we've usually seen the Italian game between these two, but now it's the Spanish, and it's the Berlin defense. No quick draw in this Berlin. Magnus pushing a pawn, just locking down the center. Hikaru unable to take white central pawn with his knight. That is the whole reason black plays the Berlin defense. Now we do see an early trade, a bishop for knight capture and white castles the king. So this one is going to enter a maneuvering stage right now. The center is pretty much blocked, but white has given up a bishop for knight and in turn, he has ruined black's pawn structure. So Nakamura looking off to the side there. He's had this position countless times before with both the white and with the black pieces. And he's just trying to dig deep into his memory banks right now, Nakamura, to pick a line, to choose an option, and maybe he'll just try and uh, choose the move that Magnus is least likely to have studied beforehand. Uh, actually, I'm used to seeing this position between the two, but with Nakamura on the white side. And uh, there we go. Nakamura still off, looking up to the ceiling, doing a Beth Harmon, <laughs> uh, just entering his mind palace and trying to come up with the most solid move. I like that word. I heard that word. I see you that you've used it a couple of times. Mind palace. I yeah. love it. It's from Sherlock Holmes That's when right. he goes into his brain and he, he's got all his files organized in his mind. But mind sometimes you just palace. need to enter your mind, your own mind, and uh, yeah, pick out the files, pick out the moves, pick out the memories that uh, that mean the most to you. So. I love that. And you know, it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> Everyone can own a palace. It's a mind palace. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, Hikaru actually playing a line that he has played against uh, Ali Reza Faruja and Levon Oronian in 2020. And uh, there he actually got a uh, 100% score with black pieces. Okay, so in general, that's quite a good strategy for players of all levels, uh, both at beginner, club, and at elite, elite levels. If you've played a move before, if you've got really good uh, experiences with it, especially wins, strong results, then just stick to what you know. Um, in general, in general, just th those patterns that you recognize, those kind of good emotions that you feel, they will be more beneficial than trying to freestyle, trying to with, come up with something new on every turn. So this is the last bishop retreat for Nakamura has netted him some great wins in the past. Mm -hmm. And this has caused Magnus Carlsen to think. And, and there uh, we go, he brings his knight out. Yep, this is very logical, just uh, getting ready to maneuver the knight to and, uh, square. I just want to uh, pop in to say something. Apparently there are some technical issues for Wesley So, so that is why Anish Giri is not looking at his computer. He is uh, looking at Magnus's game. <laughs> yeah, just yawning there, just yeah. <laughs> waiting for Wesley So to resolve those issues and then the game will start. So Wesley, maybe while his tech issues are going on, maybe from afar, he'll be watching Magnus's game as well, yeah. hoping that his countryman Nakamura can do him a favor. And uh, meanwhile, Nakamura brings his light squared bishop out. So black's light, uh, minor pieces there, the black bishops and the black knight next to it. Uh, they're looking pretty good. Yeah. Looking well positioned. And uh, here, white has a choice of moves. He can actually pick up a pawn and uh, develop the dark squared bishop. He does that. Actually repeats a line that he tried out in uh, 2012 against Levon Aronian. Uh, the alternative was actually to strike in the center, but somehow I didn't quite feel that that was uh, to Magnus's taste. Yeah, Magnus, as we know, uh, throughout the tour, he likes to build up. He likes to invite all his pieces to the party first and only then take decisive action and only then open things up. So if White had pushed any pawns in the center, trying to blow open that middle of the board, then I think it would only help the bishops, which want open lines. White's knights, uh, they crave blocked positions. And that's why Magnus has slowly just pushed a pawn. And Nakamura taking the opportunity to castle, keeping that black king nice and safe. There was the option for black to try and castle on the other side of the board. I'm slightly surprised Nakamura rushed to commit his king. But here we go, now Magnus reacting by bringing the bishop out. And look at this, Magnus, as we see on his, his screen right now, he's about to click his central pawn and push it one square forward. He's about to push his pawn on the D-line one square, as you can see with the darker highlighted squares on the screen there. And uh, that's quite a cool play zone. I love playing on that new Chess24 play zone. It's yeah. really slick, really smooth. And um, Magnus ready to ready to click that mouse if he, I mean, he's hovered it over the square and there we go, a small gentle click and the move appears. Yes, and uh, actually according to my database, no games, but of course it has been studied and uh, Hikaru is definitely one of those who has studied this and just to reinforce the center with a pawn. And uh, now 
now we've transposed into another line. And uh, here there's a few options. Uh, white can actually step forward with the queen, can uh, capture the pawn and also push forward the C pawn. But OK, this capture is a little bit unusual, not the main choice. Are you slightly surprised, Ivanka, that he rushed with this capture? Because, yes, black actually has an isolated pawn in the middle of the board now, but look at that black rook on the F line. Black's rook now has been opened up because Magnus went for this trade so quickly. Mm. It would have made a bit of sense to just maintain the tension and build up slowly. That would have been maybe more Magnus' style, but to rush yeah. it does have downsides. It definitely does have downsides, but... Uh... The speed with which Magnus has been playing moves suggests to me that this is preparation. Magnus has an idea. I would be shocked, you, Magnus, if this was preparation. <laughs> I think Magnus is just playing just purely on instinct right now, just purely on pattern recognition. Oh, you're... Know, you're I've, <laughs> I've seen I've, these top I've... players. They like to pretend they know more than they do. <laughs> Often they're just, they're just putting pieces on good squares and hoping that it... Uh... <laughs> well, hasn't that sort of been Magnus' strategy in the tournament as well, as yeah. he treated... The exactly. plan to play chess. Just play chess. Yeah. That's the key. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's any special memory work going on right now. Maybe more for Nakamura than Carlson Nakamura still peering off to the right there. Are those his famous acting skills at work? Mm -hmm. Or is he seriously trying to remember something specific in this position? OK, he just yeah. develops the Black Queen. He does develop the Queen. And uh, now I want to see what uh, Magnus has in mind. Oh. David, <laughs> you're killing the dream for I me. Don't I don't want the illusion. Sorry, Ivanka. <laughs> the top players, they're I've amazing. Kind of, yeah, they know so much, but they, they don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> but this means that just like you and me, well, actually, no, maybe not you, <laughs> me, just uh, making things up as they go along at times. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, OK, Magnus about to make a move again. It looks like he's dragged the mouse in one direction. OK, now he goes back. You're uh, great at this, uh, David, <laughs> just analysing the mouse. <laughs> yeah, for years I've been uh, playing with the touchpad, so I'm still not great at analysing mouse movements. But, um, OK, it feels like he's maybe about to move his knight. I just have a feeling. but okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's a natural move, right, to mm -hmm. move the knight. I mean, another move that I would potentially consider is uh, just uh, giving the king a little bit of space, although I realise that this does have its consequences because pawns cannot be retreated. But uh, I'm kind of like that idea. Yeah, there's lots of choice from, OK, he is about to move his knight in the middle of the board, his knight on the D2 square. He's going to bring it to the left. He's going to bring it forward and try to put pressure on Black's central pawn. But no, OK, he's just clicked off that move. So a bit of indecisiveness from the world champion. For sure, he's not in his opening preparation anymore. Now he's about to push his corner pawn forward. Oh. That's another trademark move from Magnus. And he's clicked off that one as well. <laughs> okay. That sounds kind of dangerous, though, to, like, because suddenly you lose the piece, right? I've done that before, actually. Yeah. You know, I've gone, I've thought about making a move. I've hovered over the square. I've even clicked the piece. And then now I've kind of t changed my mind. And then before you know it, the piece has actually returned to a different square. And I'm like, no, I did not want to play oh. that. In fact, that's something that Magnus did himself. Yeah. Um, he lost a game against, I want to say, Levon Aronian. Or was okay. it Otto? Um, I just possibly. remember it was it was something that there was uh, a queen move. It was, Artemiev, it was yeah. a Artemiev, yeah. yeah. It was a strange queen move. And also the first game of the whole tour this season, Magnus mouse slipped, right? Right. Mm -hmm. He tried to give check with his queen, and he dropped the queen on the wrong square, uh, where she was vulnerable, where she yeah. was about to get captured, and he had to resign against Nopomniachtchi. Yeah. So, especially with long range pieces like queens and rooks, that's where the mouse slips actually usually occur ah. because they, you have to drag them often five, six squares and. You might drop them along the way or you might drop them on the way back if you change your mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's the long range pieces. That's where you're vulnerable with mouse slips. Sh should so it be like a button where you have to confirm your move or is it good that this is... You can have that button. Okay. But it does slow you down. Yeah. Because... Especially on, when you're under 30 seconds, you don't want to have to click an extra time yeah, every time true. you make a move yeah. to confirm. So they, they decide to not have it, these players? Yeah, yes. I think by default you're expected not to have it, but you can add it okay. if you go into mm -hmm. the settings. OK, so Magnus decides to initiate action on the left side of the board and he does his uh, trademark thing, which is take as much space as possible on the flank. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, just a good endgame move in mm. general, pushing your pawns forward, just ready for all the pieces to disappear and then you can begin a pawn race favourably. And uh, Hikaru, well, he's playing very directly. He's just... <laughs> Moving his rook one square forward and uh, announcing his intentions. I'm just going to double on that line yeah. and uh, I'm going to start putting pressure on your king. Yeah, so the two black rooks are about to stack up 
against one of the white knights. That's the only real open line for black. It's a semi-open line, but it's very, very effective. If those two rooks find uh, a bit of harmony together, then white will start facing some serious threats. Mm -hmm. So Magnus has to somehow fight against the power of these two black rooks once they do arrive on this F line together. Um, or he can just ignore uh, Hikaru and call Hikaru's bluff and say, OK, that's your plan, but it does take a few moves. My plan is quicker. I'm not really sure what Magnus wants to do here, though, because, OK, he just pushes a pawn. This is what Ivanka was mentioning earlier. So two reasons for that. One, to create an escape square for the white king later on, just in case. And secondly, also to limit black's light-squared bishop. So black's light-squared bishop can't come now to that right side and harass any mm -hmm. white knights. I have to say one thing. Now that knight on the second row is tied down to the defence of its sibling. Because uh, once that knight steps away, then there's always uh, moves like bishop takes pawn, undermining the defence of the knights in the air. Yeah, so you think these two knights, they need to maintain contact, yeah. defend each other, because if the knight does move away, um, for example, if black just makes a move, if the white knight moves away, then as you mentioned, Ivanka, bishop takes pawn, and now this pawn is overloaded. It needs to defend its own knight, but now if it takes the bishop, then that knight falls. So black would have won a pawn in the process. Also, just very thematically, maybe even stronger than bishop takes pawn, which just wins a pawn. Maybe you can go for a direct attack. If black ever gets the opportunity to sacrifice a rook for a knight, look at the white king now suddenly out in the open. It's about to get checked. It's about to get attacked. Black's bishop can jump in. Black's queen will deliver a killing blow, I think. And this king is doomed. So, yeah, as Ivanka mentioned, right now, no matter what black does, this knight... Uh, this knight needs to protect its fellow knight. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if black did push, just push a pawn, I think Magnus's idea is to actually move this knight out of the firing line first. So maybe to retreat it back or to retreat it to the side and then free up his other knight to get into the game. Long-winded plan, but that's it, what he needs to do. It is a, a little bit long-winded and uh, visually it looks clumsy. Yeah. You know, to have to retreat the knight. And all the while, those uh, the rooks are still bearing down on the open F line. And the bishop, the light square bishop, is still pointing at the pawn. You know, why black is just primed to open up some lines. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's beginning to look a little bit shaky for Magnus here. Yeah, he definitely uh, is going to face some pressure. Hikaru Nakamura is going to try and attack using these two rooks, using his bishops. Uh, for example, if black can improve the knight, and maybe even this bishop maybe later on, by bringing it to the same diagonal as the white king, you need to prepare this. But if he's able to do that, it's going to be very, very scary for Magnus. Mm -hmm. So, OK, the evaluation bar, really liking black right now. But Hikaru Nakamura may be lacking an immediate breakthrough. He still needs to continue building up first. Yeah. And uh, whilst Hikaru is thinking, I just wanted to share with you some of the answers that we've got from our quiz of the day, where we're asking, what is your favourite thing to collect? And Hisham says that their favourite thing would be money. They used to collect coins from every country. That's something I used to do as well. Coins <laughs> and stamps. Uh, did you ever do that, David? No, it was only Pokemon cards for me. <laughs> <laughs> my sister used to collect those as well. Yeah. One of my most heartbreaking stories re revolves around Pokemon cards, but I'm not sure I can tell you guys without oh, please do. <laughs> breaking down. And <laughs> okay, Black just pushing a pawn there, controlling some squares. But no, I once uh, was persuaded by a friend to trade a shiny Pokemon card for his. And he was like, oh, it's a great deal. You, you, you know, it will really help you. And I was quite innocent. I said, yes, yes, yes. And now I saw that card, that exact card was sold for $120,000. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. wow. That, yeah. that also happened to my brother-in-law. But his card was stolen by his <gasps> best friend. Oh. And <laughs> Friendship over. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what happened there is that that card, that card was even right rarer than yours, which yeah. sold for a lot of them, and was sold for millions of dollars. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I wish I kept my Pokemon cards. I just threw them away <laughs> when I was cleaning my room growing up. Well, it just goes to show the value of collecting yeah. things. And, uh, OK, we have a move from uh, Magnus. He has uh, moved away his knight, and I think this one is quite uh, defensively a good move, even though it looks a bit clumsy, and that is just to relocate the knight close to the king, just yeah. in case any lines get opened. Yeah, those white knights will be the best, maybe uh, the only defenders of the white king. So a decent move there. Mm -hmm. Retreating, we never like, but sometimes you've got to do it. Yeah, sometimes you just have to clench your teeth and just go, needs must. And uh, yeah, 
And uh, another another answer from our quiz of the day is from GM Nofal, Nofal, who says, I used to collect high grades in school. Now I'm a doctor and a chess player. Nowadays, nowadays I try to collect myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good investment, right? It is. And uh, I, I like this answer from Yunish Dahal, who says, I loved collecting different shaped leaves still Ooh. do and uh, if you two want to enter our quiz of the day then you can do so by tweeting us using the hashtag chess champs or by going onto the champions chess tour page on instagram and you can post your answer there and we'll feature them on the show yeah. and uh, great prize an air things view plus and I already revealed to you guys, when I was a kid, I used to collect napkins. <laughs> I, I, you know. Okay, what was that all about, yeah, Kaya? They're not worth all that much, I can tell you that. <laughs> maybe in another 50 years, yeah, they'll be worth maybe. a lot. Yeah. Just like some of the moments on this tour, maybe in a few years, they'll be, worth, they'll be priceless. Do you still have your collection? Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, so in my childhood home, I think there's still this huge box of napkins, like with flowers and different colours and with, you know, Scooby-Doo and other, yeah. Yeah, I, I used to collect when I was a child um, erasers ah. and I used to have like all the, these different, um, it was like a, a thing that all the girls in my family did. Okay, a black steps forward with a pawn and uh, we kept them in such pristine condition that uh, later on when the next generation appeared, they, they looked at it and they're great, let's just use it. <laughs> so it goes to show. <laughs> you can, can actually be use it, yeah. Yeah, it can be passed on to the next generation. <laughs> Yes, it's all about collecting. So uh, head over to um, chesschamps.io and you can start collecting moments from the tour. And after this game, after this round of games, we will uh, talk a little bit more about this collection and NFTs and what it is. So stay tuned for that. Yes, and meanwhile, Magnus, I think you'll be very happy to, to have seen Hikaru Nakamura's last move. If you look at Hikaru Nakamura's dark square bishop right now, that black dark square bishop, it's basically trapped. It's basically a big pawn. It's not doing a great job, purely a defensive job. And with his last move, Magnus Carlsen, he's putting pressure on that bishop. He doesn't necessarily want to capture it, but he's just locked down all of the squares around it. So mm -hmm. White's Knight now doing a great job, putting pressure on Black's central pawn. The other White Knight might try and do the same job as well from the other side. And uh, Hikaru Nakamura, he's essentially tied himself down with his dark square bishop. I'm very, very surprised. I think yeah. he had a specific plan in mind, but... It's a very slow one. It's to reroute the Black Knight, and that takes a while. I, I really liked your um, suggestion, which was just simply to prepare the relocation of the dark square bishop to the, the square where this actual pawn is standing on. I mean, that seems to me much better use of resources. But one thing I also really like about Magnus's move is not only is it a forward move, but the knight actually ties down the black queen to the defense of the bishop. Mm -hmm. And uh, the queen, as we know, she's one of the most powerful attackers. And so that means that suddenly, if Hikaru wants to initiate an attack, the risks have uh, gone up. Yeah, and uh, Hikaru, with this last move, he signals that he wants to potentially signal an attack. And uh, yeah, I think this black rook move, Partly he's defending along the 6th rank, but partly he just wants to shuffle it one square to the right now, right now and to go for the White King. So White's King, not having too many defenders around it, will start to feel uncomfortable if the Black Rook does shift its focus. So this is what we call a Rook Lift. Uh, it's often quite a useful strategy, but Magnus is ignoring any threats, mm -hmm. any potential threats against the White King. And look at this, White's Queen, White's Rook there behind oh. it, and White's Knight are ganging up against Black's Dark Squared Bishop. So the Bard does not like this move. Yeah, I think maybe there was something more direct, but mm. that would have been quite complicated to calculate. So I think Magnus has gone for a very human approach. I, I quite like his move. Um, but maybe the computer says objectively there was something better. This is rapid chess, though, and I think Magnus has made a practical decision. Rather than spend four or five minutes going for something a bit more complicated, he's just continuing to up the pressure, continuing to manoeuvre his pieces to mm -hmm. good posts. Mm -hmm. All right, so a good decision. Even if uh, the air quality actually for the first time is not perfect in the Oslo Arena, Something about particles in the air in the Oslo Arena that makes that one mark red. And uh, we did hear from, we had air things here in the Oslo Arena yesterday. The only thing the air, thing, air things device cannot m measure is love. Love in the air. <laughs> Yet. Yet. Yes. We think that should be a feature. Uh, new business idea. Yeah. How to measure love. <laughs> and uh, no love lost between these two. They're both fighting hard so far. And Hikaru Nakamura's last move 
adds a lot of pressure to the white position. Look at Black's rooks and look at the queen between them. Black's rooks and queen are all lined up against the same pawn. So a lot of threats now potentially on this F line and uh, Magnus needs to somehow counter against the threats from the black rooks and queen. So I'm expecting Magnus now to just maybe defend his pawn on the F2 square. Uh, there are some things to calculate. White's knight could consider going and taking black's dark square bishop, but that bishop, as we mentioned, is not a great piece anyway. So white doesn't necessarily want to rush with any captures or trades or threats right now. Mm -hmm. I think Magnus needs to take a time out and just defend, just keep his position intact. And uh, how would you be tempted to defend that pawn that's under attack? Maybe would stepping a rook forward. Step a square. rook forward, yeah. Yeah, white's rook can defend from the second row, from the second rank. Maybe Hikaru Nakamura's threat, though, is his idea, uh, Yovanko, to actually use his light squared bishop and take white's knight. Actually, maybe we can show this because Magnus might be facing a couple of threats right now. I mentioned the key threat, the main one, is along this line. Black's rooks and queens ganging up against this pawn, this weak pawn. So, for example, if white just kind of waits and does nothing, black can consider just taking this pawn off the board. And uh, some stuff to calculate here. But also, secondarily, if white does just take a time out, the move I was attracted to defending this pawn, then actually I've just noticed that bishop takes knight might be an issue. You're actually giving up your better bishop for a knight, but suddenly, look at these pawns, they're shattered, they're isolated, and white's not, uh, the black knight sorry, is hitting two of them at the same time in conjunction with the black queen. And this would cost white a pawn, actually. So Hikaru creating two sneaky threats, one obvious one, taking this pawn, but maybe a hidden one by taking this knight. And, OK, Magnus has actually ignored those threats. Oh. Uh, ignored one of them, at least. He's kept his pawns nice and protected. Look at this formation, all on light squares. Also these, all on light squares. That's quite nice, uh, just pattern from Magnus Carlsen. But if the black bishop takes this knight now, how is he going to defend his pawns? After pawn recaptures, the knight might start hitting these guys. Magnus's idea must be to counterattack. Exactly. I think that's definitely the idea, just to step forward with the knight to attack the rook and then ask the question. Because if that rook uh, moves, mm -hmm. if it moves there, you know, there is a pawn that's under fire, under attack in the centre of the board, as David's highlighted. And, and if it moves uh, the other direction. It, well, it's, look at that. It's in the way of uh, the queen, so therefore there's no attack on the pawn, so now white can actually step forward with his own pawn at the edge and attack the knight. The knight's forced to go back. Yeah, so he doesn't quite win a pawn black here. He's just not quite in time because of white's nice counter-attacking move, bringing this knight into the action, hitting a rook. So Magnus, he's calculated this in advance, and look at all of the white pawns still on light squares. It looks a bit like checkers, just on light squares. <laughs> uh, with all those pawns. Yeah. So right now, Hikaru Nakamura has to decide, does he want to trade? Or does he have to take a time out? Does he maybe get his rook out of the firing line first before it gets attacked? He could just shift it across one square to try and go for the white king. Uh, I think this would see a blockade from Magnus. He would use his knight as the blocker uh, of this line. And he would also, in the meantime, use all of his forces, all of his energy, attacking this weak, isolated pawn in the center of the board. So it seems you're uh, a big fan of Magnus's pawn situation here. All the pawns on light squares and, and you know, but how about Hikaru's pawn situation? I mean, three of them all the way back there, it's got double pawns. Yeah, these guys, actually this one gets in the way. Yes, they're doubled pawns, but it's more about this pawn. It's in the way of Black's bishop. Black's bishop wants to use that square. Also, Black's knight wants to use that square. Uh, and also, it's just the fact that the pawns aren't connected. So there's one isolated pawn in the position because the other pawns have been deflected away. So uh, long term, strategy wise, if all of the rooks and queens disappear, then Black is actually in a bit of trouble because he has this isolated pawn. Hmm. Uh, Black has to bank on the fact that he has three relatively active major pieces yeah. to uh, create some fun, create some... Uh, Mm -hmm. action and so, compensation for his weak pawns. And, and the... Oh, oh, I was just going to say this move. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to... What happens, David, if Hikaru is like, yay, let's control the knight circuit? Now, it looked ugly, in my opinion, because, you know, you concede a lot of dark squares. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, actually, you talk about me loving to control knights with pawns, right? But I remember seeing an interview with Hikaru Nakamura a few years ago talking about Fisher random chess chess 960, and he said it's always a blunder to put your knight on certain squares because they get controlled by pawns. Huh. So he's very sensitive to uh, the opponent's knights and he always wants to control them. So we saw a trade of uh, a knight for bishop there, actually. I said black's dark square bishop was blocked in, but I think the time would come to simply take that bishop yeah. off. And now 
Black doesn't have any isolated pawns. Black doesn't have any doubled pawns anymore. But if you look on the D line, White's rook is attacking a very weak backward pawn. Mm -hmm. So Black's weak pawns have been replaced by a backward pawn, which actually is an easier target yes. for White's pieces. I also, I also suspect that he also captured that uh, bishop to kind of say, hey, I'm going to control all the dark squares because there was a consequence of stepping that pawn forward. And suddenly all those dark squares are up for grabs around on the right. Yeah, yeah around, around the king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting uh, decision there from Magnus Carlsen. And we should note as well, White's queen couldn't have got greedy on the last move and gone to take that weak backward pawn, that black pawn on the d6 square, because then black's bishop would have jumped out the way with the discovered attack. So uh, Magnus just had to manoeuvre. He had to get his queen out of the way of his rook. He wants to use his white rooks to attack black's pawns. Uh, the queen just wants to stabilise herself. So uh, right now, Nakamura... Look at the clock time as well. Yeah. This, I noticed, only really happens against Magnus Carlsen. There seems to be a bit of a mental block for Hikaru. He spends a lot more time against Magnus than he does against nearly everyone else wow. on the tour. Everyone else in the world, even. So, uh, OK, Nakamura brings his queen to the centre to defend those pawns on the dark squares in the middle. But the black queen actually came from the square f around four moves ago. So a bit of a unfortunate move there from uh, Hikaru Nakamura, or at least a reluctant one. He didn't want to have to do this, but that was the only way to protect his pawns. And now White's queen jumping into the black half. And now she's going for that black pawn on the right, that lone warrior, mm -hmm. that H pawn. So the bar is definitely awake in this game. It's going back and forth all the time, swinging to one side, to the other. Mm -hmm. Is this very like complicated even for the computer to evaluate? Yes, um, it might decide that white's better at one moment, but that's only based on some very specific, very nuanced, deep ideas, maybe 10, 15 moves down the line in uh, a certain variation. For humans, it's just beyond our horizon. Mm -hmm. um, so computers, yeah, it can be hard to trust. I've analysed this type of position with computers before many times, and yeah, they do change their mind. It's best to just stick with a very human plan that's easy for us to break down and understand. And um, in practical games, that's the most important thing. The players, they definitely won't be thinking, oh, this is plus 0.7 for me. They'll just be thinking, <laughs> OK, I'm going to slowly put my piece on better squares. I'm going to slowly target my opponent's weaknesses. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. Definitely. And uh, I think the computer has been uh, just kind of making these assessments based on all this co very committal strategical decisions. Both players have been taking pushing pawns. Like it's, it's, it's like who is using their colour complex in a more effective way. And, uh, okay, here, Black has a, a big pressing issue. How is he going to defend a pawn that's under attack? He can't quite do it with uh, the queen because, of course, the queen needs to keep an eye on the backward pawn that's on the left side of the board. And stepping back with a bishop is, is a possibility. Um, another possibility is to step forward with a pawn and try to grab as much space as possible, kind of inch forward. Um, a really complex kind of position, I think. Okay. Okay. Either way, it's difficult for Hikaru Nakamura and he decides to try and solve his difficulties by setting a trap. A bit of a trap in the position. Magnus cannot take this pawn. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to show this. Uh, okay, Magnus dodges the trap that Hikaru set. So if White had got greedy and saw a pawn, then he would have actually blundered. The black mm. rook would have come across and suddenly, whoops, the queen is trapped on the edge of the board. There's no safe squares. The black queen covers a lot of squares. The black bishop covers the squares as well. And the queen is doomed. So Magnus, he didn't take the bait. He didn't fall into that. That's why before you capture anything, always look at your opponent's threats as well. So Magnus first lifting his rook up. Uh, the black bishop now guards its pawn. And I expect to see Magnus shift his rook across, the two rooks together, targeting this weak backward pawn for black. But uh, and, uh, what do you think about this rook move? I guess it's set a one-move trap. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, in general... This rook move for yeah. her? When... I guess he just wants to defend his queen in order to maybe move his rook later to break any potential pin on this diagonal. I, I guess so, but, I mean... But either way, yeah, it looks slow. Maybe also he wants to create a square for his knight mm -hmm. to jump into the centre. OK, well, that one, suddenly I'm a bit more positive now <laughs> because it's a dual-purpose move. I'm yeah. quite satisfied with Ugg ugly, awkward moves, as long as it has uh, a second motive. And another thing that Magnus might do, both knights actually, this one looks good in the centre, but it's not a threatening anything, so it wants to relocate and uh, start maybe hitting the white queen. But white's knight, I was about to say as well, not doing anything. So this one steps back and look where it's headed. So if black's knight retreats, then white's knight can start thinking about jumping in and going to two very nice outposts, especially this one. We talked about the f5 square, where knights thrive. 
Um, this one would team up with the White Queen for a deadly attack. So Magnus just rerouting his pieces and actually we're headed in this direction. Uh, Black's Knight has stepped back and now will we see Magnus bring his Knight in or will he first just improve his Rook and team up against this weak black backward pawn? This is the big target, I think, long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's suddenly okay. looking quite awkward for, for Hikaru. Yeah, he drops his Queen back actually. This is very sensible as well. The White Queen was about to get hit by the Black Knight anyway, so uh, the White Queen steps out of the firing line. And now, next, this move is coming. No matter what, Magnus can pretty much pre-move that, uh, I think, unless Black just plays a crazy sacrifice like Rook takes Pawn, which wouldn't make any sense, then the White Knight jumping forward is going to be the best move against anything. <laughs> but you just were not playing Rook takes Pawn. you will never play that in a million years, so that's why it's quite a safe pre-move, we would say, in terms of online chess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, there was a there was a, a situation earlier on in the tour mm -hmm. where um, someone made a pre move. They they thought that uh, they thought it was going to be a check, but it wasn't a check. It was I think it was Levon Aronian again. Yeah, there's I'm been a few cases. I yeah. think. Okay, so Black's Knight trying to find a better square, a better circuit. White's Knight doing the same. The White Knight really looks a lot better now yeah. than two moves ago. Yeah, White's Knight is glorious right now. And uh, that's why we always look for weak squares in the opponent's camp. And with the center relatively blocked right now, that's where knights come into their own. The bishops are not so relevant at the moment. It's more about the knights. Mm -hmm. And okay, a strange choice from Hikaru Nakamura, putting his knight on the edge of the board. I mean, what's... what do you think of that? Yeah, what's it doing? I mean, oh, guarding the square, the yeah. F5 square, I think that's and the uh, reason, right? pretending to threaten an attack. I think he's just trying to scare Magnus Carlsen by putting the Black Knight as near the White King as possible. Yeah, we call this kind of stuff oh, bluff. And wow, uh, take a look at Anish Giri. He has won game one against Wesley So sitting right behind Magnus there. A fantastic start for Anish Giri and uh, kind of for Magnus Carlsen as well. Anish Giri winning game one against Wesley So with the black pieces as well. Yeah, look how calm he is, Anish Giri. Yeah. Just a silent assassin there. And maybe when he does get up, when he leaves the arena, Magnus will spot that and he'll see the kind of uh, the lift yeah. in uh, Giri's walking. He'll realize that, oh, wow, Giri might have won. He's done me a favor. And that might inspire Magnus Carlsen. Would have been kind of cool with a little bit of a high five walking out. <laughs> <laughs> not teammates, but, you know, obviously Magnus will want Wesley to not gain too many points. But there, there must be that feeling, actually. Yeah. You, you mentioned it, that they're not teammates. They absolute, absolutely aren't. I mean, they're playing an individual competition. But the fact that there's just the three of them sitting in one room, yeah. playing against the rest of the world, or what it feels like the rest of the world, yeah. I mean, there must be some sense of that they are brothers in arms. But on Friday... Magnus and Anish will be up on the podium to fight against each other. So yes. the team feeling will be gone on Friday. Oh. So many big more ma uh, big matches yeah. to come. And okay, Black's Knight has actually decided it wasn't too happy on the edge of the board and it stepped back. But Hikaru, he's wasted a lot of time with his knight now. And Magnus has seized the opportunity to leap into, uh, into the black half with his own knight. And now the Black Queen forced to a really, really passive square. White's Knight doing a great job. It's going to maybe assist an attack and also hit black central pawns. Yes. Now we see Giri. Yeah, didn't seem like Magnus noticed it, but uh, Anish Giri heading out, the winner. And actually, it looks like uh, we're going to have quite a, a decisive first uh, set of games here on day five. Magnus Vachier Legram seems to be better. The bar likes this situation against Jan Christoph Duda sitting behind Magnus. And uh, Timur Rajab with the black pieces. The bar likes this situation against Levon Aronian. Yeah, and now and, uh, all of, I mean, Nakamura is about to go under one minute and all of his retreats over the last three moves have inspired Magnus to push forward. Magnus is moving in for the kill. He thinks that this is the moment to strike. And this pawn move has maximized the tension. He's trying to open up the diagonal for white's dark squared bishop. Look at that white dark squared bishop. It's been asleep for most of the game, but it's about to come to life and it might come to life decisively. I think Hikaru Nakamura's position is just... Mm -hmm. on the brink here. Mm, He's yes. going to go down to defeat because... Right, because after knight takes pawn, it looks great, but the rook takes knight and suddenly that bishop it has awoken and will swap itself off for the rook. And uh, just take a look at Black's king. It has no pawn shelter whatsoever. I mean, that king side is just shattered. Yeah. And uh, so many pawns to choose from. I mean, which one would you take? I would just take that pawn in my camp, in my half yeah. there. Um, that black pawn with the on queen the F4 or the square. 
both. Exactly, <laughs> both, look both look good. Probably I would take with the rook, but uh, there's an argument to be made for both. So um, right now, white is temporarily one pawn down, but he has a choice of two different pawns to recapture. And once Magnus does take back one of his pawns, just compare, firstly, king safety, but secondarily, the white knight versus the black bishop. White's knight is just, uh, I mean, it's just superb. And black's bishop not really doing too much, hitting thinner. And uh, look at that. Jan Christoph Duda sitting behind Magnus. A draw in his first game against Maxim Vashiergo, so he has been able to save it then. Jan Christoph Duda. It uh, didn't look too good for him on the bar. And also a win for Vladislav Arteme with the black pieces against Shakriyar Mamadyarov. And also the bar likes the situation for Rajapov with the black pieces against Aronian. But in this one, it's the one with the white pieces that you think will actually win the game. Most likely. Magnus is in the driver's seat. There's still a lot of work to be done, but right now, uh, too many weaknesses in the black camp. And okay, Magnus, I'm surprised by that decision. He swapped oh. off the queens, mm -hmm. but he is winning a pawn in the process. So now Magnus, rather than being a pawn down, is a pawn up. But Nakamura at least has activated his king. And uh, yeah, suddenly the margin for error has maybe lessened slightly for Magnus. Now, if the knight trades itself off for the black bishop, then yes, it's a pure rook end game. But remember, rook end games have a drawish tendency. So Nakamura, I think as well, due to his love of end games, especially in rapid and blitz chess, he will be very relieved at that decision from Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, I mean, especially it goes against the advice that we've been giving throughout the tour, which is like, don't swap of queens if your opponent's king is vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, when we were playing double chess again, <laughs> Against Anish Giri and uh, a strong women's international master, Adrian, we were quoting everything back, and it was uh, all our phrases back at those two, and uh, we did quite well. Yeah, we did very well. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think Magnus. Yes, he's still in control because White has an extra pawn for no real compensation. But if uh, he isn't able to deliver the knockout, uh, if he isn't able to finish things off over the next five ten min uh, moves, he will start to regret taking the queens off. Mm -hmm. Look, however, at what Magnus has done. This is why he's such an endgame maestro. The white king has gone on a journey towards the center and it's also cleared a square for white's rook to start checking the black yeah. king. And the uh, yeah, the black king will then go to the edge of the board and then suddenly that black king is just cornered there. Yeah. And uh, you, in, in endgame, just remember this. Teamwork makes the dream work. And if you get that so that all your pieces are op in operational on op active squares, you will always have good chances to hold the game. And Hikaru, he plays the move he needed to play, essentially. He's pushed a pawn, stopping White's Rook from delivering a really nasty check. So Nakamura, he's not known for his poker face as well, shaking his head there. He's unhappy with his position, as he should be. It is difficult, but he's still fighting. He's still kicking and he's alive. And uh, Magnus, we see his screen. What move is he going to play? I suspect he's about to move the white rook right now. But where? Which direction? White's to knight looks perfect. White's king looks perfect. How do you keep improving? To the middle. You put the rook in the middle on an open line. Support the white knight. Yes. Yeah. That looks very sensible. And uh, what else could you consider? You could consider maybe pushing a white pawn, challenging the black pawn that's just moved. but. I don't know why. OK, he does push that pawn two squares forward. So he's saying to black, you can take me en passant. You can take that white pawn as if it just moved one square with the black pawn. A bit of a special rule. But that allows white to recapture with a check. So Magnus just trying to get a grip on the position, trying to tempt Hikaru into taking this pawn, which he most likely won't. No, you do not want to capture that pawn because uh, one thing we've highlighted that, you know, as soon as the rook gives check to the black king, the black... Oh, okay, he does. He does. Maybe he thought there was nothing else to do. <laughs> okay, we, I stand corrected. And now the king now is just lumbered in the corner, stuck on the edge of the board. Okay. Now black's rook trying to hit the white knight. That white knight can move or white can step a pawn forward in the middle to defend it. There we go. That's very natural, actually, because yeah. it kind of then allows the white king to mobilize and get in on the action. The white king is just going to make a beeline for those pawns on the left side of the board. Yeah, black's king is just cut off. The black king is not going to participate in the rest of the battle. And white still has an extra pawn. This one is almost hopeless now for Hikaru Nakamura. And you can see that on his face. Uh, he's not happy at all. Magnus, meanwhile, looking focused, looking calm looking like a different Magnus from yesterday, where mm -hmm. he did struggle. 
Yeah. I mean, it's just really interesting, actually, how he was willing to get himself into a shaky opening. Okay, so we have a few moves. The bishop's been drawn backwards. And uh, Magnus just establishing a grip with his pieces. I mean, but it was just a quote that he he said a few a few months ago in the after the Crypto Cup that every time Hikaru sensed that he was winning, mm -hmm. he got nervous yeah. and he slipped up. Yeah, Hikaru against Magnus, there is just this mental barrier. Well, we know his famous record against Magnus over the board. I think he lost 12 or 13 games in a row um, without winning a game. OK, there were some draws in between, but uh, Magnus was winning 12-0 in their head-to-head -head scores for at some point. And it took a long, long time for Hikaru to strike against Magnus over the board. Mm -hmm. And also online in the big clashes, Magnus so far has, uh, has quite a decisive lead. So, OK, White's knight now perfectly centralised. White has put his pawns on light squares on this left side, so they are slightly vulnerable to Black's bishop, but... But, but you know what I'm going to say next? Arabian checkmate. There will be something ah, called again. an Arabian checkmate in the air if the Black bishop gets caught on the wrong diagonal. So if, if, if it goes on, like, pawn hunting and actually grabs that pawn that's sitting on the B line, then the knight will... OK, okay you're going to see it here. If that bishop moves... Yeah. That's it. The rook will lift up to the top of the board and uh, deliver a check, which will be checkmate to um, the Black King. OK, and wow, Magnus actually doesn't go for the, any oh, but checkmating he's ideas. banking it. I mean, he's just saying, your king is just awful. Mm -hmm. It's just lumbered there in no man's land. All I need to do is just walk my king very casually. It doesn't even need to run to the left side of the board. The rook will come and gather up some pawns. Game over. Yeah, so White's king has his eye on those pawns. And, uh, yeah, Magnus actually gave up his extra pawn in the process as well. So it does look like it's just three pawns versus three pawns. It's a rook and game, notoriously drawish. But it's just the difference of kings. That's why we, we go on and on about king activity in endgame. King activity is everything. Essentially, White's going to be playing with an extra piece, the king. And, and here after it comes. This, yeah, after this knight is recaptured, White's king is headed straight for those black pawns. <laughs> and a rook alone cannot defend them. White can add his rook to the attack later. So, OK, Hikaru trying to bring okay, his rook across. Here it goes. The king is in. And I guess the only move that Hikaru can play is just to step back the rook, give a check. And now the king will tuck itself away in the corner of the board. Yeah, so White's king will just maybe step back, keep an eye on those black pawns. And then while Black's king is still cut off, still unable to cross the barrier that this white rook has created, then White's rook will shift and go after Black's pawn mm -hmm. in the corner. OK, Hikaru just waiting with the black rook. Magnus now, I'm surprised the evaluation bar says only plus one point something. It feels like it's... This weak. feels like <laughs> it's like in the bag. Yeah. Magnus has banked it. Uh, just using Monopoly terms there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he needs to... I was trying to make some property puns with Monopoly, but <laughs> not coming to me. Um, but yeah, Magnus... What, what, which uh, property is the most expensive in the English Monopoly? It it's Park, Park Lane. Lane. Park Lane. Okay. Yeah. A very high-end part of London. <laughs> but uh, White's Rook now shifting. So White's Rook is no longer cutting off the Black King. The Black King can start racing across. But look how far away it is from where the action is really happening. Oh, shaking his head. OK, Magnus shaking his head. Has he miscalculated something? May, I mean, I'm surprised he let the king out this quickly. Um, I don't think he needed to rush with this rook move, but now he must just be trying to work out what happens if the white rook comes up to the top of the board and swings across to the left and takes some pawns. Maybe black's king is coming uh, towards the white pawns in time. So a bit of counting is needed, a bit of calculation. He needs still to be careful. Hikaru is still fighting. This is why he's so strong. One of the best blitz and rapid players in the world, Hikaru, he's, he just never gives up. So tenacious. Mm. Uh, OK, White's Rook. Can it go to the top of the board? That's the most obvious looks, move right now. It looks like the most obvious move. I don't see the problem. There we go. The rook goes up. I mean, the king, it takes too many moves for the king to uh, chase away those pawns. So it, it would, must be something to do with this move, mobilising the rook. Yeah, so White's Rook can start going off after the black pawns right now, but Black's Rook is going after white pawns and uh, especially that white pawn that is undefended on the b3 square, the white pawn that keeps everything else covered. So Mag Magnus, OK, he's winning, but he has to be very careful still. Accuracy is everything in endgames. No matter how amazing your position is, no matter how many pawns up you are, no matter how active your king is compared to your opponent's king, you have to stay focused, you have to calculate very correctly. 
Yes, uh, you can't uh, celebrate until the game is won. Yeah. That's something I was always taught when I was a kid. OK, Magnus raising his eyebrows, maybe realising it's not as simple as he thought, but OK, the next move at least should be quite straightforward. Uh, the white rook can go to the corner now, the top left corner of the board, and start munching on the black pawns. I think you'll end up a couple of pawns ahead if you're accurate. I mean, is it also, I mean, if, if you don't want to calculate that much, I mean, could you be looking at also just pushing your pawn forward? Your A pawn? Your A pawn, yeah. undermine, because after all, there are some positions that you know are totally winning and they can act as signposts and guide you to the victory. So, for instance, I'm just thinking ahead. I'm just thinking to something that we talked about in an earlier show, like the Lucina position. That's like a 100% winning. Yeah, but I would be very worried that if white's pawn steps forward, black will just take that pawn, and the more pawns disappear, mm. the further you are from victory. Um, it's definitely on the radar. It's on Magnus's kind of list of candidate moves. There are only really two logical moves here for white, either to bring that white rook to the left corner or to push his pawn, but either way, he needs to be careful. OK, he brings his rook okay. across. Oh, so he has, he has a crafty idea up his sleeve. So if the rook comes down to attack the pawn, then he wants to switch to my move, which yeah. is to push the pawn forward. I think that last move clinches it, actually, yeah. for Magnus. A really, really sophisticated move. This is one to put in the mind palace and store it. Yeah, so Black's rook now going after the white pawns. And, uh, OK. Magnus, how is he going to finish off this game? He's about to play king takes pawn. King takes pawn. We see it on his screen as well. And now this last pawn push, making use of a pin. Black's pawn there on the b6 square cannot go and capture white's pawn after this attack because the black rook would fall prey to the white rook. And really nice touch. Yeah. He's going to ensure that Magnus is going to make a new queen with his pawn very shortly. OK, Hikaru's last chance is to go after white's remaining pawn. And OK, this guy's racing up the board. Anna the A-pawn, mm -hmm. she's about to but win wait, the game. But wait one second, I mean, is there any hope for Black in, like, giving up his rook for that far advanced pawn and then uh, grabbing the pawn? We'll see. We'll okay. see, it might be a, a race. race. Yeah, so Black's only hope is to give up his rook for that far advanced white pawn at some point, but he needs to pick off White's remaining pawn and he needs to get his own Black pawns running. So that's a lot of <laughs> ifs. That's, uh, <laughs> that requires everything to fall into place at the right time for Nakamura, but he's got a glimmer of hope, potentially. Oh, by the way, we were told that the most expensive property is Mayfair. Oh, not Mayfair. Park, oh. Not Park Lane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's a purple for, one, anyway. I worked in Mayfair for a few years. I should have known that. But, Ooh. Um, yeah, it's too expensive there. can barely afford a, <laughs> a McDonald's, let alone anything else in Mayfair. And, uh, OK, the Black King coming across towards the White Pawns. And, OK, Magnus captures a pawn and the white king sidesteps. He's only two squares away from promoting to a new queen. Wow. Okay, but the evaluation bar doesn't necessarily approve of that. Will it correct itself? Nakamura thinks it's hopeless. I think it's game over as well. I can't see the black pawn being quite quick enough. This type of position, this is uh, where you really need to put it on a board and study it at home mm. and do a bit of counting. Mm. You can do it in your head. It's a very linear path as well. It's I go here, he goes there. I go here, he goes there. It, there's no branches. It's forced moves only. And there's one also, one significant thing. Take a look at White's Rook. White's Rook is in the ideal spot to block any checks. And also, if the pawn steps up to the seventh row, it is in the perfect situation to create a shield for that pawn. And uh, so this means that the trade will happen much sooner. The trade for the rook and against pawn will happen much sooner than uh, Nakamura would like. And there, uh, Magnus, he thinks he knows he's winning, but he just put in his, he his yep. head in his hands to calculate. And this is what Yvanka means. The white rook wants to slide across next move. White doesn't actually want to make a queen on the next turn. White's rook is going to slide across and block the black rook from sacrificing itself. So it has to sacrifice itself immediately. And here we see the race. Yes. Is that black pawn quick enough? Nakamura on his camera thinks not. The white rook is going to stop that pawn. There we go. And now the white king's going to sprint back towards that black pawn. Nakamura resigns. His pawn wouldn't have been in time anyway. And Magnus takes the win. <laughs> it's a win. First game for Magnus Carlsen against Hikaru Nakamura. Great start to the day for Magnus Carlsen. What a great uh, win as well. It took uh, 15 minutes, but uh, it's just like a classical Magnus kind of win, you know, the, the pawns just racing up there. Yeah, that's why he loves to push his pawns early in the middle game, because he knows if it comes down to an endgame, it's always going to be a race, and it's always about one move here, one move there, and he has such great endgame technique. Also, 
Nice to see the world champion wearing shoes today. <laughs> uh, yeah, People got them yesterday and he did lose yesterday. So maybe it's all about the shoes. He's going to have 10 minutes, Magnus Carlsen now, before game two where Hikaru Nakamura will have the white pieces. And uh, it was, uh, Magnus arrived a little bit late. It seems it's been a little bit of a stressful day. So he wants to just get back to his lounge and get ready for game